The Awakening by Kate Chopin, Chapter 29. Without even waiting for an answer from her husband regarding his opinion or wishes in the matter, Edna hastened her preparations for quitting her home on Esplanade Street and moving into the little house around the block. A feverish anxiety attended her every action in that direction. There was no moment of deliberation, no interval of repose between the thought and its fulfillment. Early upon the morning following those hours, passed in a Roman society, Edna set about securing her new abode and hurrying her arrangements for occupying it. Within the precincts of her home she felt like one who has entered and lingered within the portals of some forbidden temple in which a thousand muffled voices bade her be gone. Whatever was her own in the house, everything which she had acquired aside from her husband's bounty, she caused to be transported to the other house, supplying simple and meager deficiencies from her own resources. Arobin found her with rolled sleeves working in company with the housemaid when he looked in during the afternoon. She was splendid and robust, and never appeared handsomer than the old blue gown with a red silk handkerchief knotted at random around her head to protect her hair from the dust. She was mounted upon a high stepladder, unhooking a picture from the wall when he entered. He had found the front door open and had followed his ring by walking in unceremoniously. Well, come down, he said. Do you want to kill yourself? She greeted him with affected carelessness and appeared absorbed in her occupation. If he'd expected to find her languishing or reproachful or indulging in sentimental tears, he must have been greatly surprised. He was no doubt prepared for any emergency, ready for any one of the foregoing attitudes, just as he bent himself easily and naturally to the situation which confronted him. Please come down, he insisted, holding the ladder and looking up at her. No, she answered. Ellen is afraid to mount the ladder. Joe is working over at the pigeon house. Well, that's the name Ellen gives it, because it's so small and looks like a pigeon house. Someone has to do this. Arabin pulled off his coat and expressed himself ready and willing to attempt fate in her place. Ellen brought him one of her dust caps and went into the contortions of mirth, which she found impossible to control when she saw him put it on before the mirror as grotesquely as he could. Edna herself could not refrain from smiling when he fastened it at his request. So it was he who in turn mounted the ladder, unhooking pictures and curtains and dislodging ornaments as Edna directed. When he had finished, he took off his dust cap and went out to wash his hands. Edna was sitting on the tabouret, idly brushing the tips of a feather duster along the carpet when he came in again. "'Is there anything more you will let me do?' he asked. "'Oh, that is all,' she answered. "'Ellen can manage the rest.' She kept the young woman occupied in the drawing room, unwilling to be left alone with Arobin. Well, "'What about dinner?' he asked. "'The grand event, the coup d'etat.' "'It'll be the day after tomorrow.' "'But why do you call it the coup d'etat?' "'Oh, it'll be very fine. All my best of everything.' Crystal, silver, and gold, serves flowers, music, and champagne to swim in. I'll let Leonce pay the bills. I wonder what he'll say when he sees the bills. And you ask me why I call it a coup d'etat? Arobin had put on his coat, and he stood before her and asked if his cravat was plumb. She told him it was, looking no higher than the tip of his collar. Well, when do you go to the pigeon house? With all due acknowledgement to Ellen. A day after tomorrow, after the dinner. I shall sleep there. Ellen, will you very kindly get me a glass of water? asked Arobin. The dust in the curtains, if you'll pardon me for hinting such a thing, has parched my throat to a crisp. While Ellen gets the water, said Edna, rising, I will say goodbye and let you go. I must get rid of this grime, and I have a million things to do and to think of. Well, when shall I see you? asked Arobin, seeking to detain her, the maid having left the room. Well, at the dinner, of course, you are invited. Not before. Not tonight or tomorrow morning or tomorrow noon or night or the day after the morning or noon. Can't you see yourself without my telling you what an eternity that, that is? He had followed her into the hall and to the foot of the stairway, looking up at her as she mounted with her face half turned to him. Not an instant sooner, she said, but she laughed and looked at him with eyes that at once gave him courage to wait and made it torture to wait.